Good evening, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, so first of all, I have to thank everyone for giving me this opportunity, sir. Uh, my talk is on sequence of fixation in shaft skulls, type 5 and type 6 tibial condyl fracture, sir. So as you all know, the, from the uh, nomenclature and from the classification that uh, these type of fractures are very high velocity injuries, uh, often resulting from road traffic accidents. And uh, if you, as you go through the literature, there is a very high reported rate of complications as high as 27.9 percentage. So the deep infections of up to 23 percentage and non-unions up to 10 percentage. So uh, our understanding in the recent years has improved from what it was originally thought like a sagittal plane fracture to it's a more like a, a three-dimensional fracture. It is a anteromedial and posteromedial fragments. So this led to better understanding and proper uh, 3D cuts helps in pre-operative planning. So my uh, important message is, is since this is a uh, dealing with the high velocity injuries, we have to be a little bit cautious before operating. So we have to make sure you have a good soft tissue uh, swelling has come down, is reduced, and then uh, wait for the wrinkling sign. Then you will start your procedure. So whenever you are dealing with a joint subluxations or a dislocations, or when there is a suspected uh, vascular injury or where you, the plastic colleague wants to explore, or when there is associated uh, fascia compartment release. So it's always ideal to use a joint spanning fixator as a temporary measure. So once the swelling comes down and when the soft tissue heals, then you can think of a definitive fixation. So use this span, scan and plan principles. So coming to the advantages of the spanning external fixator, one is that it helps in the uh, reducing the venous return and uh, it reduces edema. It relieves pain to the patient and also helps in proper wound care. So I'll go to my case example, sir. This is a 57 year old male who presented following an RTA. Uh, with a bicondylar tibial condyl fracture with no neuro neurovascular deficit. So as you look at this X-ray, uh, if you carefully watch, there is a double outline on the medial side, tibial condyl. And one more striking feature is you can see the extensive soft tissue swelling. Uh, extensive soft tissue swelling. So this is a case where we need to uh, wait uh, and then pro do a proper periodic planning. So this is a, the, uh, you do a proper CT evaluation, you do all the cuts. So one cut which is very useful in planning is this axial cut. So as you see this uh, axial cut, you are able to see uh, two fragments, an anteromedial fragment and a posteromedial fragment, uh, the middle and also a large lateral fragment. So here, uh, as you do the preoperative planning, so these are the problems you are going to address. So first thing is there is an impaction. So you are going to disimpact the fragments. Second thing, you are going to address the varus, correct the varus. Third thing, you are going to reduce the split medial tibial condyl fracture. And then you can see uh, some intraarticular loose bodies as well. You're going to remove the loose bodies. And finally, you're going to restore the condylar widening. So coming to the uh, operative steps. So this patient was taken for, for surgery seven days after the injury. So we went by a medial approach. So as I said, first, you have to give up adequate traction. You have to disimpact the fragments. Uh, sometimes you may have to use a femoral distractor to uh, distract the joint. And once you are uh, exposed to the medial side, you can reduce the medial tibial condyle using a Weber's clamp or a pointed reduction clamp. And here we have used a 3.5 uh, uh, system like a 4mm cancellous screw to achieve the medial side uh, condylar compression. And then we have used a 3.5 buttress plate to reduce the varus. So, and another uh, thing is we have removed all the intraarticular loose fragments. And we have, once you have exposed to the lateral side, uh, this is a very useful clamp, this periarticular clamps. Uh, so this tries to reduce the condylar widening. And you can use multiple K-wires to uh, till you complete your screws. And you can use a, a wrap screw technique where you can uh, address the lateral condyle. So this is the final uh, CM picture uh, showing a reasonably good uh, articular reduction. So uh, when we calculate the angles, the medial proximal angle was 89 degrees and the posterior slope was 8 degrees. And uh, the condylar uh, red line, which indicates the condylar widening, that is also has been restored. The condyle uh, has been adequately reduced. So this at the end of three months, this X-ray, and this is one year follow-up X-ray showing a good uh, outcome. Uh, moving on to my second case, this is a 32-year-old male. He had a fall from two-wheeler, presented six hours after injury with a tense swelling. Uh, here, one more important finding is that Apart from the condylar widening and the joint depression, there is a subluxation of the lateral uh, condyle fragment. So as we go through the literature, uh, there is one paper which tells about the prediction of the meniscal and ligamentous injuries in this type of lateral tibial depressions. So they authors say that majority in 83% of these fractures with uh, at least 5 mm of lateral tibial widening and more than 6 mm of plateau depression 
you always encounter a uh, meniscal impact uh, meniscal impingement so you have to disinfect the meniscus you have to do an arthrotomy so uh, then we did a, a ct planning a ct scan to plan our uh, uh, surgery so we found that there's a lot of uh, comminution in the central portions and there is a split uh, medial condyle as well there is anteromedial and posteromedial fragment so but because of this combination there is a small posteromedial fragment so here uh, we thought of using two plate construct so first thing you need a stronger implant like a, a locking plate to address the varus like a medial locking plate and you need a, a, a an implant to buttress the posteromedial fragment so we used a 130 blur plate to buttress the posteromedial fragment so through medial approach the patient in supine position we did a two plate technique and then uh, moving on to lateral side, we exposed the joint, did a uh, uh, submeniscal arthrotomy. We visualized the uh, depressed articular fragments, we elevated it and temporarily held with K wires. And then we used a uh, 3.5 lateral locking plate as well. And uh, this is the uh, wound picture after the closure. Uh, this is the immediate post-operative X-ray. And uh, this is the end of uh, nine months. So fracture has consolidated well. Uh, but few things uh, to be noted are that still there is some uh, articular incongruity uh, like picture on the lateral side and uh, the posterior tibial slope is slightly increased up to 11 degrees and uh, but uh, the proximal medial tibial angle is 86 degrees and uh, there is subtle uh, condylar widening as well. Uh, so, but uh, ultimately this patient had a reasonably good uh, functional outcome. He had a knee flexion of 120 degrees uh, and he went back to his uh, normal profession. Uh, moving on to the third case, it's a 46-year-old female. She, uh, she had a fall from a ladder 10 feet high. Uh, she had a closed uh, uh, bicondylar tibial condyl fracture, no neurovascular deficits. So when we did the CT scan here also, we noticed uh, there is a large medial fragment and as well as a posteromedial fragment and also a lateral side severe depression was there. So here we thought of doing a dual approach. One was to address from the posterior side. Uh, we exposed the posteromedial incision and then uh, did a, a buttress plate. And then we turned the patient supine and did an anterior plating, plating as well. Uh, but uh, this patient was uh, very much obese and she was uh, a short statured and BMA was more than 35. So ultimately during the healing, we noticed that this slowly this fracture uh, went on to a slight little bit of varus and it has healing little varus portion. There is some amount of condylar widening as well, but uh, and uh, this patient had a, a fair outcome, I, uh, not a very good outcome, but uh, knee, knee movements are reasonably okay. So when we went into the literature, we found that uh, the, uh, there is a paper on complications in uh, tibial plate fractures. So patient-related factors like obesity, diabetes, and tobacco use, these are all uh, more prone for infections. And, uh, and uh, there is a, a quote that... Uh, anything like class two obesity and they're more prone for non-unions. So it may be as high as 20 percentage uh, when compared to 7.8 percentage when non-obese patients. So uh, this is my take home message. And uh, so whenever dealing this a uh, type five and type six Schatzker's tibial condyl fractures, these are all very high velocity injuries. So don't operate these fractures in haste, do a th thorough preoperative planning, use the span scan plan principle and always take care of the fracture length and restore the axis, elevate the articular depressions, and also restore the tibial condylar widening. Okay, thank you very much for listening. Mm -hmm.